well know that I love to tell my stories. I love to tell my stories. Whether it's at a social setting or, or in a homily to give an example of something, I often tell stories. And most of the stories, I call them my stories, as we often can do. Things that happen during life. I've been at this for a long time. People will say, Father, you could write a book. You've probably heard that before, right? But sometimes there are stories that I've heard or stories that I've read. And today I'll tell you what I call, I call it my favorite story, but more than favorite, it's kind of like, for me, maybe one of my most important stories to remember in terms of life and, and, and the scriptures and living it. I think it goes well today. So you might have heard it before, and I've seen it in a few different little variations when I encountered it first, it was in one of Father Anthony DeMello's books. He was a master storyteller. It goes like this. It's the story about a Chinese farmer who lived in a very tiny, poor village way in the interior of the country, kind of isolated from everything else. And it was, all the folks in this little village were very poor, but this, this farmer, he had something that set him apart from the others. He had a horse. And you can imagine, in a poor village, a farming village, to have a horse, what a difference that made. Well, one day, the gate was left open, and the horse ran away. And the bad news of this spread quickly like wildfire through the village and all the villagers came to him and just wanted to commiserate with him about this bad news. But the farmer kind of looked and, and shrugged his shoulders and simply said, bad news, good news, who knows? Wow. Well, about a week later, the horse made its way back. You know? came right back, went right into the enclosure, followed by 10 other horses. It had been up in the hill country, and they all came in, and the villagers looked in amazement, and they were rejoicing at the farmer's good fortune. But of course, the farmer just kind of looked at them and said, good, good news, bad news, who knows? The very next day, his only son, was trying to tame, to break one of the horses riding it. He was thrown, and he broke his leg. What a terrible calamity. But the farmer, the farmer was simply, good news, bad news, who knows? And then some short time later, the army came. The army, they didn't even know there was an army. They did not know. They were so isolated. They did not know the country was at war, but the army came, and took all the young, able-bodied men off to war, except for one who had a broken leg. Good news, bad news, who knows? Now, the story is interesting, because when we hear stories, we take them in, and they, they, the example speaks to us. And I've had people say to me, oh, I love that story, Father, because what does it mean? It means when God closes a door, he opens a window. I've actually seen that framed in somebody's home. Great little saying. When God closes a door, he opens a window. And I always kind of smile and say, well, that's okay. That's a nice little meaning. But for me, it actually means... Good news, bad news, who knows? Which upsets some people who will say, what do you mean? What do you mean? You mean we can't know anything? What you, we're just stumbling through life and nothing makes any difference? And I say, no, it's a story. It doesn't say that. What it says to me is this. God is God and I'm not. And I do well when, I, when I'm able to embrace a sense of mystery in life, rather than thinking that I know everything about what's good and not so good. Early this past week, I got an email from a guy I know from my last parish, and he has, uh, he has ALS, Lou Gehrig's, and he's had it for really a, a while now. He's really winding down in his life, we might say. 
And he sends me this email, and I've seen him off and on. I, I made an appointment to uh, plan to see him this week. But his email said, Father Len, struggling with some things religiously and philosophically, hoping you can help me, starting with the premise of a kind, loving, and merciful God, how are there so many cruel and horrible things happening in the world? Terminal and horrible diseases, he said, like mine, like his, mass shootings, horrible wars, evil people, starvation, and suffering, to name a few. Sometimes I find myself questioning my faith. And I got the email and I said, boy, Joe, you really think, you must think a lot of me to think I have the answer to the eternal questions, right? That we all ask. But I gave him a few thoughts and it was early in the week, but as the week went on and I was reflecting on the scriptures and the parable and the weeds and the wheat growing together and letting them grow, by yesterday morning, I simply emailed him my homily outline, which is always quite extensive and I'll see him this week. But it is that sense of, well, you know, what do we know? I mean, I say, I know God loves me, and I know that, that God is kind of, you know, watching over his, his field with all that's growing, and God is patient in time, and it's all this mystery. And it's all this mystery, and do I embrace the mystery of life, or do I feel like I have to have an answer for everything? Early in the week, I, got a, I was contacted by your parish office and, and a secretary or whoever said, Father, you know, you're coming the following weekend and we, uh, we print the, the scripture verses in the program, I guess, and uh, there's a long form of the gospel and a short form. Which, which are you going to use? And I said, the hybrid. <laughs> and I did. I had a deacon read the hybrid because I wanted at least the, the three parables because all the parables speak about that sense of mystery. Can you imagine? Have you ever seen, have you ever seen a mustard seed? It is, it is like a speck of dust. And can you imagine 2,000 years ago where ancient people seeing the speck of dust and saying, really? This is going to become a bush that's so large, the largest of all bushes that even a bird can, can, can build a nest in it. How does that happen? Or the mystery of, of yeast. However, they, they came up with yeast, but, you know, I, the woman could mix it with this flour and, and then let it sit, and it rises and the bread is so much better, you know? And how does, this, how does this happen? And again and again, you know, the parables of Jesus, when we look at them, there's so much that speaks about the kingdom of God, and he tells a little story or gives a little example, and it's about embracing the mystery of life and letting the kingdom of God break in upon us. One of the, you know, one of the problems I, spiritually, I think, of the world we live in is not the evils that, that Joe spelled out, you know, that's in my back pocket. Because the world has always seen those. You can imagine during the time of the Roman Empire and the Christians in the, in the Colosseum. You can imagine during the Black Plague when people were dying left and right. You can imagine different times. I think one of the real challenges today is the world of science. The world of science. I love science. I get on Google News, I'm a sucker for reading about anything about the universe. Except that scientists now seem to think that we can find the answer for everything. And every time I go on Google News, it seems there's a new, you know, uh, theory about the universe or something that the telescope has seen, or else medical science is talking about who we are and what makes us tick, and they think they almost have human consciousness figured out. Oh, we can know everything. I think it's great God created us to know and to discover, but ultimately we can't know the mind and heart of God. I mean, we can't. 
that the God who created everything and holds it in the palm of his hand and is leading us to the fullness, to the harvest, to the fullness of life in the kingdom. No, we can't know that. And so whether it's the story or the parables, part of them are about God, but part of them are about us in light of God and living the mystery. And when you listen to that story about that Chinese farmer, isn't there part of you that says, oh, I wish I could be like that? <laughs> you know, when we find our lives are going through highs and lows and one minute we're excited about this and the next minute we're watching the news and we're depressed about this and we get angry about this and all those kinds of a, oh, don't I wish I could have the equilibrium of that, of that farmer, or knowing the parables, allowing the weeds and the wheat to grow and know that God's in charge. All I need to know is that God loves me and is leading me to the kingdom. And when I, when I know that, I, I'm less angry, I'm less anxious, I'm more loving, I'm more caring, and I live that sense of wonder. Pope Francis, what, he's 10 years now, he's been Pope. He's up there, we don't know how many years he has left, but 10 years. But when he's gone, you know the one, th what's he gonna be remembered for more than, more than anything else? I think five words he spoke early on. Do you remember them? You'll know them as soon as I speak them. Five words. Who am I to judge? And a lot of people got upset with those five words because it was about, a, they thought, a moral issue. And, and it's like, well, heck, if the Pope can't judge, who can, right? He's the Pope. And yet there was enough of, you might say, the Chinese farmer in him to look at life and to say, well, you know, yeah, but ultimately, in any one of us, who knows how God is working through our lives? And we do well when we, can, when we can step back and not think we have to know or have to judge everything. And so we do well when God is God and I'm not, <laughs> when I can embrace the mystery of life and when sometimes I might even say to myself, who knows?